us. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, uh, we have a panel today to discuss um, investment strategies in different uh, sectors of shipping. Um, and uh, therefore, because we have uh, people from different sectors, um, but also in some respects different business uh, strategies, I think I'll kick it off by asking everybody to sort of introduce themselves, uh, talk about um, the fleet they operate and their business model and how that links into their uh, investment strategy. Shall we go by, uh, let's say, from, from a right to left? Would you like to start, Jerry? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, Capital Product Partners, I'm the CEO of Capital Product Partners, and um, we own today uh, seven um, latest technology, two-stroke LNG carriers, 15 uh, containers, and one no dry bulk vessel. Our business model is uh, one of um, uh, investing in uh, assets with long-term charters attached. We tend to be a bit agnostic in terms of um, the um, asset types, but uh, we are taking advantage of the platform of uh, capital, which is a cross-segment, so crude product, containers, LNG, um, and dry bulk. And hence, uh, we are very cognizant of um, um, residual risk and where we are in the market in terms of entry point. And hence, we tend to, um, to like long-term um, cash flow visibility that um, mitigates uh, potential residual risk. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Leon Patitzas, Atlas Maritime. Uh, we own a fleet of uh, tankers, and we recently invested in uh, car carriers as well. Our business model is uh, quite simple. We try to buy low and uh, sell high. <laughs> so joking aside, we try to identify sectors that have uh, uh, been underinvested and they have uh, the values and the prices of the vessels are below historical averages. And when the values move above historical averages, and uh, when we uh, double our equity, uh, we try to sell. We operate the ships, we try to put them in uh, long-term time charters, and uh, always try to manage risk by choosing credible counterparties, and having uh, low levels of leverage. Uh, we have been invested in dry, uh, we have been invested in uh, tankers, and uh, like I said recently, in car carriers. And what attracted us in uh, going back to tankers was the very low values. We placed an order for five Aframax new buildings in November 2020 at uh, close to 20 year historical lows. So we ordered the ships for 45, for example, and earlier this year, we sold them for 61. So <clears throat> we try to be disciplined. When we see a good profit, we try to take it. And uh, we're always of the opinion that we should let some chips on the table for the next person who is coming in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Congratulations on that deal, at least. I think that was well done on the efforts. So I'm coming from a very different perspective. In, uh, in Merce Tankers, we're a service company, which means that uh, basically we drive the service of commercial management. So our investments is a lot about the service and how we invest in actually securing optimization of the different vessels that we run. And we run some 200 vessels, which means that we do indeed have quite a lot of business that we're looking into upon our doing our own investments. I think currently what we are looking a lot on is uh, the ability to actually handle the markets. We trade spot. So our ability to be able to foresee which earnings we need to create for our pool partners is indeed central and utmost important. And so is actually the sanctions and the different regulatory regimes uh, of the uh, decarbonization regulation coming on board. So our investment strategies are going towards improving the actual service we deliver. Good morning, and uh, is this working? No. Uh, good morning, my name is Evangelos Hadzis. First of all, let me say congrats to Marine Money for the fantastic venue. Uh, doing a conference in shipping and having this sort of view over there is uh, very inspiring. 
Um, I'm the CFO of Danaos Corp. Uh, we own a fleet uh, of 71 uh, container ships. We're a pure play container, uh, container ship lessor. Uh, we also have six ships on order currently. Uh, our model is uh, one of um, strong contracted cash flows. We're very mindful uh, of, of managing uh, residual risk on our investments. And, uh, uh, you know, as, as Leo said, you can never go wrong uh, when you buy low and, and sell high. Obviously, we are not in S&P. We are in the business of running our ships long term, servicing our customers, such as Maersk. And, uh, you know, we are uh, facing a significant slowdown in the world economy and, and demand. Uh, so uh, there will be opportunities as a result of this crisis. And um, we can discuss how we can take advantage of them. Okay, thank, thank you, everybody. Um, so um, given the different models, perhaps we'll, I'll address different questions to people. But... Um, Let's start by looking at the, the current market. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have had some uh, good, uh, good, uh, year, good times in the recent, uh, recently. Um, uh, returns are better. Um, where, do, where do you all see um, opportunities, investment opportunities in the current cycle? Um, is this a good time to buy and what type of ships? Uh, shall we start with maybe uh, is this working? Yeah, okay. It's very tough to source uh, compelling investment opportunities right now. It's been very tough for the past couple of years. Uh, as a company, we have managed uh, to do some transactions that proved to be highly accretive. Uh, we did them along the way as the market was seeing highs every week practically from uh, the fall of uh, 2020 onwards. Uh, but it's, it, it has become increasingly more difficult uh, to do good projects. Uh, and obviously, we are now seeing uh, the signs of, of softening in our uh, market. Freight rates have dropped considerably, so the, uh, the earnings of our customers will be affected. Uh, this, in turn, will affect and has affected charter rates and charter tenors. Um, and ultimately, this will reflect in, in lower prices. So uh, with all the geopolitical uncertainty uh, in, in, the, uh, in the equation, uh, uh, you know, I think it's best if one can be patient uh, to see where things are headed. And uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that the market softening uh, will produce great opportunities. As a company, we have the benefit of having uh, a 2.3 billion contract backlog uh, with charter coverage of 90% for next year and north of 70% for 2024. So we have the certainty of cash flow coming in. Our leverage uh, is we, we will soon be net debt zero in a few months. So the way we are approaching this is we're building a fortress balance sheet. We, we have the strength of of a big uh, liquidity on the balance sheet, and we will be there to take advantage of deals when they come along. Uh, it's just that at, at this point, I believe people should be sort of uh, cautious about what they do. I can at least uh, give a couple of perspectives on the markets from the tanker side. Um, so I do hear you, I hear the softening as well, but I think what's important to realize is actually if you go in and look at the tanker market at present, some of the base fundamentals of supply and demand are actually really strong. They're very tight. They have actually been for quite some time. And of course, the peaks that we have seen within the last couple of months since the war broke out are definitely there. They're there because we both got the arbitration of the oil, but they're also there because we had a two-tier market, which basically meant that which if you went in and did the Russian liftings, you were actually able to get some of the very high rates. But that does not take away the actual base fundamentals of the market, meaning that we're actually looking into and expecting some of the strong markets to continue for at least one to two years. Yes, we might miss some uh, out on some of the peaks, but I think the volatility is going to be created. Uh, I think that is where you have an area to be in if you actually go in and trade spot. 
But what I see from the ship owner side, at least from, uh, from the owners that we have in our pools, is that investment environments right now are difficult because basically you can't get a new vessel. If you order today, you won't get that new vessel until 25, 26. And then you have secondhand uh, vessels that are at incredibly high prices. That makes it really difficult to take the investment decision, also because basically you don't know which fuel to put in. So I think there is a lot of uncertainty, so uh, definitely a softening of it, but uh, I think with current prices, you would basically need the market to stay high for the coming 20 years, which of course is rather tough. Thank you. <laughs> we always try to study the fundamentals as well, and we look at uh, the demand, the supply. On the tanker side, what we see is that on the tanker side, what we see is that uh, the order book is at a historical low. Four and a half percent of the tanker fleet is on order. And most of the yards are booked with container ships and with LNG vessels. So the earlier deliveries are probably in 25 or 26. And um, we're also seeing that the trade patterns are changing because of the war. So all this Russian oil that used to go to Europe now has to travel to China and India and it's being sold at a steep discount, and therefore ton miles are increasing considerably. And this is why tanker utilization has gone up so much and rates have gone through the roof. So <clears throat> we see the fleet being quite old. The new regulations are coming in uh, 2023. We know that uh, uh, there are requirements to reduce carbon emissions, 40% needs to be reduced by 2030, and uh, ship owners need to invest in new vessels. Uh, this is why we have invested in uh, brand new ships, and this is why we've also ordered LNG dual fuel PCTCs. Uh, we try to manage um, our portfolio by selling older vessels, increasing our liquidity, getting ready for the recession that might be looming, and um, keeping a strong balance sheet for opportunities that might arise in the near future. So we are, I guess in the fortunate position where we sit across uh, segments. And um, when, uh, when you want to pin down, even in a simplistic way, where you are, in the cycle, and you look at, uh, let's say, average uh, values versus values today's, uh, today of uh, asset prices, you'll find that container values, uh, despite the correction uh, over, the last, um, um, over the last couple of months, we are still maybe 70, 80% above 10-year uh, historical averages. And uh, as far as tankers or dry bulk is concerned, that's around 40 to 45%. Um, then LNG is uh, obviously more difficult because you have the technology changes, um, but um, if you just look at new building prices, they have moved from uh, about 180, 185 to 250 today, so another good 40% increase. So it's very difficult to uh, think in the traditional way when it comes to entry points and, um, uh, and cycles. Um, the question is, are we across all segments at, um, at um, the upper end of the cycle? So we should um, um, think twice before investing today? Or are there other mitigants such as um, the uh, geopolitical distortions that came with sanctions um, that will uh, boost, for example, a ton mile demand uh, ahead for, for tankers that would support these values? Um, or um, a more um, sustained demand for shipping overall. Um, the way that we think about it is, um, as I said earlier on, that when you, when you are buying at above historical averages, you should be able to have either a very strong spot market where you will uh, take down the vessel quite quickly to, you write it down very quickly to um, closer to historical average, or in our business model, uh, have a long-term charter attached that um, will get you there. And 
I think across segments where we see the most opportunity is probably the LNG uh, segment because firstly, you can find those charters. You can find five, seven, 10 year charters at uh, rates where they will help you write down the vessel down to historical averages, uh, but also very credit worthy counterparties. And finally, um, there is a lot of um, fuss about uh, the LNGs and given the natural gas situation in Europe, but the long-term fundamentals of, of the industry remain intact, and they were there even before the crisis. So um, across the segment, that's probably the one that uh, we think there is the best combination of fundamentals as well as um, offer of long-term uh, charter. Hello. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, it sounds like uh, I hear a lot about patience and caution, um, but if you structure it right, um, that, that there may be opportunities out there. The, the big que question, I guess, um, uh, or the big elephant in the room is, of course, how um, uh, the industry is moving to, towards decarbonization and you know, buying a ship, if, if you're buying a new ship, you know, it's got, it's got 20, 25 years ahead of it um, of life. And how do you manage that risk of not knowing what um, alternative fuels will prevail in the future, what new regulations are going to be in place uh, going forward? How do you manage that when you're assessing an investment right now? Um, yeah, go over again. Is this working? Yeah. So you don't go all out ordering conventional uh, ships with conventional propulsion, right? Um, you know, no one knows what fuel will prevail. Uh, there is no certainty whether, you know, what supply chain uh, will bring in terms of production of green methanol or hydrogen or ammonia, what is safe, what is not safe, what is toxic. There's a number of questions around fuels that haven't been answered. Uh, and of course, there is a drive towards decarbonization and targets that uh, the IMO has set and all of our companies uh, have also committed to certain ESG uh, targets and so on and so forth. Uh, but, but the reality is that a lot needs to happen in the background in order to move towards uh, having ships that materially emit less CO2. Uh, therefore, uh, the things that you can do now is invest in your existing fleet uh, and, uh, you know, in energy saving modifications. And we've done quite a bit of that over the past decade, actually, before all this became uh, trendy, uh, where you can achieve some savings and have your fleet being more competitive in relative terms versus other uh, ships in the industry. Uh, definitely. Uh, despite the, the, the slump right now, the world will continue. Uh, I mean, the world trade will continue to require ships to transport goods. So I don't anticipate, we don't anticipate that the existing fleet will uh, anytime soon start becoming redundant because of regulations. There will be a long period of phasing out. There is indeed, uh, as it was mentioned before, one of the big challenges of investing in the, in the coming years is exactly to uh, be able to renew your fleet uh, in a way that takes you, br brings you to the forefront of innovation in terms of uh, lower emissions and so on and so forth. Um, we are very mindful of that and this is something that you know, really affects the way we think and how we uh, strategize for the future. Uh, but uh, you know, this doesn't mean that uh, in the interim, you cannot find attractive opportunities of existing tonnage that you can acquire uh, with, with good consumption characteristics and be at the top tier of, of ships that are operated at any given point in terms of uh, environmental uh, friendliness. Um, therefore, yes, new buildings is going to be the, the big theme going forward as the fleet renews, but it's going to be over the next 10 to 15 years. This is not something that will play out over a couple of years. 
I think you actually started by touching upon a really important uh, point as well. We are talking a lot about the current really high markets, but uh, actually we don't talk much about what we've learned throughout the tanker period in very low markets, which have actually been ongoing for quite some time. Which meant that over that period, we have indeed, as you said, been looking into how we optimize and how we run each and every vessel, each and every voyage, and even increase our ability to optimize at the fleet level. And I think these parameters, which are basically the parameters that we are looking into a lot from the Mersangas perspective in the commercial business, is actually not only good for the environment today, because it basically allows us to reduce the amount of brinker consumed, but it's also going to be really good in the future. Because quite honestly, the new fuels that we're touching upon, we don't have them readily available in the right amounts as of now. So everything that we can do today to learn how to burn less fuel, the better prepared we're going to be when we get the new vessels on the water because we won't have to burn as much because we are able to optimize. So I think from a service provider perspective, at least that's really important. But those are learnings from the bad times, actually. <laughs> a lot of the politicians promised um, everyone that there's going to be an energy transition. but. Um, uh, nobody has really thought about, you know, if the infrastructure will be there, if uh, those fuels will be readily available. So it's really important to be pragmatic, and we believe that, you know, fossil fuels will be uh, around for a longer time than people think. But of course, we need to consider alternative fuels like LNG, ammonia, methanol, etc. But what is important is also to look at how the energy is produced from the well uh, all the way to when it's um, consumed. And uh, if we are trying to produce green energy, but in the meantime, we are expending more energy and we are producing more CO2, the net net effect will be worse off than burning LNG, for example. So we, we talk to classification societies, engine manufacturers, um, um, a lot of industry participants. Nobody has um, a straight answer. Everybody's still looking for the right fuel. And uh, the industry will need to invest you know, billions of dollars to new technologies. And this is what everybody's doing. And we hope that uh, there won't be just one answer, there will be multiple answers. So, as ship owners, we are in a business where we have to continue to service our clients. We cannot just sit back and um, wait for the new technology, propulsion technologies to come uh, through immaculate conception. We need to invest um, in the technologies that are available today, and that will continue to support R&D in uh, improved technologies, uh, alternative fuels, propulsion, and so on and so forth. So, um, as far as we are concerned, and the wider capital group, over the last um, um, almost two and a half years, we have ordered 43 ships. Um, that's uh, around 5 billion in terms of uh, magnitude of, uh, of the order. Um, and that has been always with tier three, phase three vessels, uh, in many cases, in certain cases, dual fuel ships, in other cases, um, ammonia or DF uh, ready with energy saving devices, um, alternative marine power um, um, preparation, uh, which uh, not only for containers, but also for, for tankers, because this is also coming. And we have adopted the latest that is available today. That's the way to go forward. Waiting, and in that way, you can also support um, the, the industry to, to take a step further. But this is not enough. And the eulogies are good, but uh, I think the next step would be really to get all, all parties involved um, in uh, the shipping chain properly incentivized. Market-based measures like the ones discussed um, at the European Union level or uh, the IMO will effectively internalize that, that externality for the people that benefit from the transportation of cargo. 
And it's only then that people will be also willing to pay for vessels that are more energy, not just more energy efficient, but also have um, uh, CO2 emissions abating technology. Because right now, a very efficient vessel, a vessel that has uh, a smaller carbon footprint, is a good to have vessel for many charters, but really they won't pay up. They will pay for the energy savings, but not for the, um, for the savings in uh, carbon intensity. So I think um, we're in the right direction, but uh, it's also very important for, the, for everybody involved in the chain to be properly incentivized, and especially those who benefit uh, from uh, the transportation of goods. Uh, it sounds to me that um, there are additional risks um, in place now when you're making those investment decisions. When you're making those investment decisions, um, because of all these factors, um, the market is volatile, but also the technologies that you discuss, the the optionality you need to have on your vessels. It, the, there is a question mark on on how long. You know, does that change, what I'm trying to get to is, does that change the, the investment horizon you're looking at? Is it much shorter now? Um, how, do you, how do you manage that risk? So let's say, like you said, Jerry, um, you still need to uh, accommodate to your customers' needs. You still need, we still need to have goods transported all over the world. So that's not going to stop. But there are many more question marks than there have been before. How do you manage that risk? Um, what strategies do you have for that? Well, I think um, investing in vessels at the right um, um, market price has been always important and we should not um, forget about that. So, uh, yes, you might be investing in an asset that potentially uh, has um, um, a shorter lifespan uh, compared to, or higher depreciation compared to if, if there will be new technologies to come. Although I'm not a big believer that we will see a huge revolution in propulsion um, in, in the short term, if not the medium term. Um, but at the same time, there are opportunities. So I think as uh, ship owners, uh, we can invest, um, take advantage of the fact that, of the low, very low order books, because um, part of the reason that the order book is so low is because people are still puzzled about uh, the uh, propulsion um, uh, question. But be also very aware when you find the right exit uh, to be able to, to capitalize on that. There will be opportunities. So in, in environments where there is increased risk and uncertainty, there, is also, um, there are also opportunities for higher reward. But um, having the knowledge, the know-how, the people, being present in the market, being adopting technologies, all that will give you that, that edge so that you can uh, compete even in markets with increased uncertainty like the one we're facing today. Any, anybody else wants to add something to that? Or? Well, it's interesting talking about managing risk and uh, and, and time of an investment horizon and all these things. So we are today we are we have a war in the European continent, right? Which people fear that it could escalate uh, into uh, you know uh, you know people using tactical nuclear weapons and what have you. That's a big uncertainty. Uh, you have an energy crisis that has come from all that. Uh, record inflation rates. Uh, market stumbling, and on the you know we we're coming from two years of of, of COVID, so one month to, in today's time is a much longer time than what it used to be five years ago or ten years ago, right? There is a lot of things happening, a lot of uncertainties. So managing risk is uh, you know a daily exercise, right? You cannot put a strategy in place and say that's what I'm going to follow for the next three years. You have decarbonization, you have all, you know, and all these things sometimes are conflicting with each other. How do you decarbonize when you need uh, fuels and Europe is now looking to replace uh, dependence from Russia? You know, I mean, these things, so that's, a, that's the long way of saying you have a lot of moving parts. Um, 
uh, as Jerry said, you can never go wrong if you invest, if you buy cheap, uh, ships cheap, right? Uh, and, uh, but it, 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 it's an evolving situation, and all you can do to prepare for it is have uh, the balance sheet and the liquidity to be able to grab these opportunities when they come. But I don't think that so uh, today someone can credibly say that he can have a strategy for the next five years that will serve him uh, when, from the get-go. Yeah, and I think um, actually one of the things uh, with the whole thing about risk management is basically how do you take emotions out of these discussions. Uh, as ship owners, I think quite a lot of us do get caught onto the emotions like how the market is, I mean, is, uh, is the sky the limit, especially in current markets. Um, so for me, at least, there's a lot about how do we actually get to look at the bare fundamentals and what the market really looks like. Take out the fluff, like I just discussed with Chris just before we got up here. How do we take out the fluff, and how do we make sure that we're looking at the fundamentals when we actually take our decisions? Because I think it's going to be key, because there are so many moving parts, and it's going to continue to be like that for at least some time. I think the market will be much more volatile. We've seen interest rates going up at a really fast pace, the fastest pace we've ever seen. The yield curve is inverted, which usually points to a recession coming in the next six to nine months. And uh, not only there is a war on European soil, but there is also an energy war. So we saw OPEC cutting production by two million barrels a day. We see that uh, the Russians are using energy as a negotiating uh, tool or negotiating weapon. And we think that there's going to be a lot of volatility. So. Ship owners need to be vigilant. They need to take advantage of opportunities to sell when values go up and be disciplined. It's always tempting you know, to keep an asset when it's producing very good cash flows. But um, like the old ship owners used to say, it's better to sell and regret than, to, than not to sell. And uh, we think we need to also take uh, time charter coverage and uh, keep uh, low levels of debt. Uh, and if uh, you follow these simple strategies, you're gonna weather out the storms, and you're also gonna have a chest, uh, a treasure chest, you know, or the buying power to buy when the market dips and opportunities will come. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your, your views. That's all the time we have. We're actually three minutes over time. So I would like to thank the panelists. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your views.